Yeah, welcome back to the second part of the topic, do we need an industrial grade Linux? My name is Lars Geier Blaumeiser. I'm from the Bosch Group. And uh, in this part, I will discuss this topic together with four experts from the field, which I will introduce now. Uh, first of all, Kate Stewart from the Linux Foundation, um, Guy Lunardi from uh, Colabra, uh, Jan Kischka from Siemens, and last but not least, Andre Barkowski, also from the Bosch Group, uh, as myself. So um, my first question, so I, I did uh, some introduction on the topic, but uh, I would like to hear from you. What do you think is an industrial grade Linux? What are the parts? What uh, are the characteristics of something like that? And I would like to start with the industrial um, uh, guys. So Jan, perhaps you can start uh, with your opinion on that. Yeah, well, if you think of uh, industrial grade Linux, you obviously think of something which is very mature um, in order to serve the, the use cases we have here. Um, that affects, I mean, um, the whole the whole system. Um, it also affects how long this system uh, is already available and how long it will be available. Um, as our devices are living so long in the field, um, we are not eager on switching uh, every other year to a complete different architecture. So this is one of the key element I would say, um, besides of course also aspects like, like real time, uh, which is important not for all of the use cases, uh, but for a good share of it. Um, security uh, is an important aspect obviously, um, which affects several aspects, um, the hardening of the system itself, but also where the packages, where the components are coming from, how they're being maintained. Uh, and also how they can be updated. Um, if they can be updated easily, um, that's obviously a very important thing. Um, safety is of increasing importance, um, though I would say for many of our scenarios, uh, it's not yet critical um, in the sense that we are massively using this um, based on Linux systems, uh, but for other systems, obviously it is. Um, yeah, and last but not least, I would say um, important is also that this is an uh, ecosystem friendly solution we find. Um, there are many suppliers in our, in our chain. Um, we get software from the communities, we get software from our suppliers. Um, and whatever comes out of this, um, we have to integrate it. Uh, in the end, we are delivering it to our customers. Um, so what we get has to be in the right form and easily combinable and degradable um, and also in the form that it can be upstreamed or is upstreamed to the communities already um, so that there are less steps to take in order to get something running. Thanks, Jan. Andre, what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, I can only agree on that. Uh, and um, yeah, more or less uh, um, for us, it's for sure the flexibility for our custom products. So industrial grade Linux for for me is always addressing customization and custom product flavors. And we need a lot of flexibility for that, especially since we do not only create a single product uh, type. So if you have a wide range of product lines and setups, uh, yeah, you need versatile product boundaries. And um, yeah, then last but not least, uh, we are going uh, on targets. So we have a, a wide range and flavors of hardware variances. So very different silicons, SOC vendors, system sizes and resources. And due to this lineup of uh, industrial products, we have typically different technology partners per product type. So, um, and these are again fading, uh, so there are no clear boundaries. So what we need uh, one day in one product, we need another day in the other two, and it's, it's no more so clear, uh, so clear boundaries like in past. Um, for sure, like I said, we have long product life cycles which is a challenge. And then we have a lot of aspiring needs like shorter time to market, uh, 
like already said, this more merging uh, product boundaries. So things what was former two devices becomes now one single device. So things converge and merge into into single ones. We have growing feature richness and partner networks. And even more than in past, we have an after SOP life. So formerly it was more uh, targeting specific feature set, a well-defined feature set for SOP. Uh, meanwhile, the features are continuously evolving after SOP, so over lifetime. Uh, and in combination with our long product life cycles, this is an aspiring challenge. And for sure, like I said, together with security, especially the product types which are connected and there's long uh, cycles. So again, this also leads to a challenge in the collaboration and liability ecosystem approaches, uh, yeah, all that and that you design your system already in the initial phase in the way that you can master the challenge after SOP during product life cycle. So that's for me all about industrial grade Linux. Thank you, Andre. Guy, you're from a company supporting bigger companies in using Linux. What's your point of view? Um, I think I think both of them have covered a lot of the use cases quite well. The the thing that resonated me the most with what was just said is this notion that in the past industrial Linux was sort of affording itself to have a little bit of a release and forget mentality where you could harden a Linux based operating system once, put your application workload on top of it and, and never really worry about worry updating it because it wasn't online or it wasn't exposed or it's fairly well secured. Uh, when we were preparing this, Kate was joking about having them being welded on the side of something that you, you would have to go through a significant amount of trouble mm -hmm. to, to undo that. That's changing. Everything is now connected in one form or another. Everything is in many ways more vulnerable. And, and that's, that's a, a dimension of the complexity unrelated to feature functions, use cases, requirements from the users that we all have to face. And so um, I believe that the landscape is changing before because of that. In many ways, the SOC vendors and others have achieved that convergence that Andre was just talking about, where you can get a single SOC that will address you know, 80%, 90% of your needs, and you put that on a module, and you can get to carry your board that will do that, or you create a, a product around that, but that doesn't address the complexity on the software side. Our life as the software people has just become harder because you have one, two, three, four MCUs next to your ARM cores that you need to all make everybody live together in harmony. So while the wiring harnesses might become easier and smaller and we're reducing costs there, the complexity effectively of the software to drive all these hardware assisted technologies on the, on the CPU sides and the various SOCs has definitely grown over the past few years. And um, it, it's important that an industrial grade Linux that understands all that the bigger picture of, of having to build something that supposedly fit on the 128 kilobytes hard software source, which obviously Linux isn't going to go down to, but even just 32 megabytes, 64 megabytes. In some cases, you know, we have vendors that come out with SOCs that have 64 gig attached to them. So it's, it's all over the place from very small to very large. And uh, that software complexity that helps reduce the total cost of the hardware um, is something that we've seen increasing over the past few years. Hey, thanks. Kate, what do you have to add to that? Well, I um, certainly agree with everything that's been said up till now. I think a lot of it's been covered. Uh, to me, if I hear the phrase industrial grade Linux, I'm sort of thinking that there has actually been a scrub set of configurations that make Linux dependable and predictable. Um, so it can be used in environments where we have to cons consider ourselves with security and safety. Um, and, you know, we've got Linux kernel hardening projects, we've got a variety of other pieces in the ecosystem, real-time Linux projects and so forth. Uh, industrial grade Linux is probably bringing a lot of those things together and um, making it so that we have a community that's basically focused on getting those configurations dependable and can be used from iteration to iteration and knowledge can grow as part of that. Um, an industrial system is going to have to be modular. As you see, there's a huge range of use cases <laughs> that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to have, you know, components that you trust and 
that um, you can basically build off of. And ideally, you'd like to see some of these components being, you know, in well-supported um, projects. Um, one of the things to me I'd like to see uh, is I'd like to see any project that's being used in the industrial grade Linux to actually have a CI badge so that their practices are transparent and there's a chance of sustainability. So you don't have this little dependency all the way down that no one cares, that no one knows about until it bites everyone with the security vulnerability. So um, those are the sorts of things I'd like to sort of see because I think we're going to need them in the ecosystem, especially after we start going after safety certifications with open source. Okay. Thanks to you. Yeah, when while prepare, preparing this session, I learned that industrial grade Linux is not my uh, our invention. <laughs> so it has been used uh, surprisingly <laughs> in the past. And um, of course, for us, it's it's really the question of whether we, we identified a gap that's really existing or if there are already uh, projects uh, running. So um, I ask basically all of you, uh, do you know of, of initiatives that have yeah, targets uh, which are similar or, or slightly different uh, addressing such topics? Well, one I was aware of um, last year was the OpenIL project um, from NXP, and they're trying to work in um, that area. Um, I know Jan was looking at it a little bit. Maybe he wants to chat about what he was finding. Yeah, so I was I was finding an, an interesting uh, integration approach. I mean, this is one of the key elements, obviously, for industrial grade Linux, as we just said already. You have to integrate a lot of parts, and this is what this project is doing. Um, it is centered around um, the NXP projects or uh, devices, obviously, uh, pulls in a lot of open source elements. Um, and yeah, this is an interesting point to start with. Uh, obviously, you need a critical mass for these projects. Um, that's what we see also in the civil infrastructure platform project. Um, it's, it's not that easy to start in the domain. And well, I'm in this domain, industrial domain for quite a while now even before I joined Siemens. Um, and it's it's not the domain um, where you, well, you may know from the server space and the cloud space, uh, which is overly agile and uh, collaborative yet, um, uh, but it's coming. So uh, the challenge is definitely to get a critical mass for these projects and these initiatives. And that's probably also why you see a lot of them, but besides obviously a lot of commercial offerings, um, they get the critical mass by the customers, uh, but uh, for collaboration, the challenge is really to get from this industry the buy-in um, to have enough people on the table and working together for their goals. This is actually also an interesting yeah, point where we uh, started the, the CIP project around, um, which was around uh, devices um, yeah, from the civil infrastructure domain long living devices um, where we first try to get some members or get some companies together um, in this domain to work on uh, common goals, uh, which was new for some of them. Um, and yeah, this is this is definitely something you have to consider if, if you start a new project in this area. Yeah, from our side, so maybe I can contribute in this. Uh in this direction. So what we found are several approaches which were, how to say, uh, um, focusing and uh, dependent on specific specific uh, uh, points of interest. So sometime around the specific silicon, some, some way what kind of uh, functionality has been provided uh, we also uh, started with several commercial vendors, again, who coupled uh, the solutions for sure around their technology. So we find a set of silos, I would say. And uh, this is one thing. So finally, uh, we even utilized in different projects, different starting points, and uh, this lead to a lot of fragmentation with, with inconsistency in between, um, which is really one of the, the major pain points which uh, motivated us uh, to change something. So uh, yeah, this 
unneeded inconsistency and local focus on a certain scope from from that point the second thing is uh, that the collaboration model which has been utilized in these approaches was simple not uh, yeah, powerful enough for a kind of ecosystem approach it was it was more uh, focused on on customization so that you can tweak and uh, achieve what you need for your particular individual product even if you break compatibility on that way with others and um, so you need more meanwhile so this uh, this upcoming needs and over the long uh, life cycle um, needs really a different approach, especially in the collaboration model and uh, the flexibility in, on a wider scale. And uh, yeah, this is something which we haven't found uh, uh, so long uh, in these available solutions and starting points. Since, since we're talking about communities, uh, while we're answering your question about what existed before, I'll contribute in a slightly different angle, which is if, and I'm not going to name names, but if you look at some specific use cases areas where there has been communities that have come together to create something, robotics comes to mind. And, and a lot of those projects, academia and outside, people doing industrial robotics are using community projects that they're collaborating on. But the platform itself, the Linux kernel, the bootloaders, the base layer of the middleware was completely absent of their consideration. So some of them are stuck on like six year old versions of a standard off the shelf Linux distribution. And, and they're using that. And some people are transposing that into production or you have the same thing with some of the current edge computing machine learning use cases where, I mean, uh, Andre said the evil world, right? They, they, they use the vendor SOC BSP platform, which again, took us back, you know, five versions back of the Linux kernel, not minor, like I'm talking major versions back. And that's what they're saying, use that in production. And, and, and that's, a, that's what scares me a lot. You, you see people focusing on their use cases and I really commend them for that. Again, using machine learning or, or robotics as good examples of that but they've somewhat ignored the complexity, the security, the safety aspects of what they're running on. And, and we can't really let that happen. I think there is a gap here that needs to be filled of a robust, trusted, mature, validated, capable of over the air updates, if available, Linux distribution type software solution that people can build on top. Because right now it's a free for all out there. If you're in academia or if you're doing again, just robotics or machine learning as examples, it's scary. It's scary today. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we have done the same things in every team again and again. So yeah. what we finally have is uh, lots of uh, embedded devices and product teams with their own mission. And uh, due to this uh, different starting points and especially the hardware relation or product specific pieces, which is their their major focus in the, at the starting point, uh, yeah, they started to to move forward in their direction, the other team in the other direction, and then tons of teams in different directions. Uh, everyone repeats somehow similar things and later on they have to master the long-term challenge. So uh, yeah, what we, are, what we are looking for is a collaboration model which passes this product boundaries and uh, team setups so that they can really collaborate uh, across these boundaries, uh, but still fulfilling their mission in creating their custom products. So what you're saying- yeah, I absolutely agree with this. Yeah. Sound sorry, infrastructure Dave. to build on top of. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we need to have a, a set of infrastructure that we're all agreeing on is dependable so that people can differentiate on top of it. Is that a fairly good summary. Yeah. Is that the idea? Andre? Yeah, the idea is uh, how to say um, it's uh, finally it's a modularity. So right. you, you really <laughs> also what we said with the, with uh, how to say to have a real reality check. Finally, there are uh, silicons which we utilize in this embedded uh, an industrial industry uh, where you get. 
a certain set of kernel also from your silicon vendor. It's it's simple. Uh, sometimes uh, needed that you exchange something even down to the kernel or you have setups without any kernel where we deploy something together with mm -hmm. other software in a container or whatever. So you, it's not the way that you build up a system bottom up and you have it uh, more fixed in the lower level and more freedom in the upper level. You have really freedom and modularity. Oops. I think Audrey was bringing up a really good point here, which is when we modular. when we think of industrial Linux, we can't just think of bare metal, slap a kernel on top of that. And yeah. It's never that way in reality. Like if you mm -hmm. are lucky this way, more power to you. But for what we see, type one, type two hypervisors, uh, host kernel environment controlled by the vendor, but then everything is containerized. We already, we have been doing that for some time in various form of products. Um, so I think that's another, that's the modularity point that Andre was trying to make, which is it's not always just bare metal hardware, bootloader, Linux, middleware, the applications on top of that. Because if that was the case, anybody could do it. But you have complex SOCs, one, two, three, four MCUs next to it. You need the real time micro OSs to run on those with one, two, three, four, five, ten virtual networks, Ethernet or else shared memory between the different nodes, sharing the resources one GPU, two GPU, all of that needs to work together in a cohesive fashion. And again, safely, securely. And um, I think that the industrial Linux need to be aware of that. You can't just say, this is my system image for x86-64. It's been tested on a QMU uh, a vert emulator. Go have at it because that is so far from reality. <laughs> and, and that, so yeah. do we also potentially need to look at having an industrial Linux having a test suite for basically making sure we don't have regressions beyond a certain level on some key core functionality? Do you consider that part of it then too? Jan. Yeah, I guess I mean, this is definitely an important point. I mean, testing is uh, not invented uh, for industrial Linux <laughs> and I hope it will be used by industrial Linux, definitely. Um, I mean, activities like kernel CI, uh, projects uh, exist. Uh, they also scratch only part of the problem, obviously, because the problem is large. Um, it's also about here a collaboration topic. I mean, the nice test infrastructure is, is good, but you also need to have the right tests for that. And if the users are not really communicating their requirements in form of tests or at least of specifications for that, uh, you as a platform provider um, are not testing the right thing. So this is also very important uh, to get everyone on board on these things. Um, integrate uh, the different components, not only to run them, but also to test them. So yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, definitely. Andre, we tried to finish your point for you about modularity and the complexity <laughs> coming in more form than, than, than just a single Linux distribution. And, and uh, Kate brought up the point of uh, testing being a critical part of such an infrastructure that you need to provide visibility in test reports in automating yeah. some of that. So yeah, and I, I think, think CIP, CIP mm -hmm. saw the importance in testing from the very beginning. It's one of the areas where that project yeah. contributed the most. Kernel CI does that for the whole of the Linux kernel. And I personally, I'm, I'm one of the founding members of the project and I feel like we test too much and that we've had these arguments internally where you have <laughs> too many branches, too many tags, we, too many vendors, like we already sending sort of the wrong message because we're allowing people to be so distributed and fragmented and all that. So maybe there is a need there as well for consolidation. The, 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 the SOC, the silicon is becoming more tight and compact. Maybe we should do the same thing with our kernel configurations. And so we have something a little cleaner the way that Kate was suggesting it. We're not there today, but that's a, that's a step that I think the industry should take. Mm -hmm. uh, quality assurance is a really important thing for our embedded devices. Uh, what we see on our side, and if you, since we have this wide range of uh, product uh, setups and uh, system resources, we also we reach complexity and feature sets uh, where we really run into huge challenge of the system integration and to qualify that. So this is one thing which 
uh, which forces us also in regard to the quality assurance uh, to move a step uh, forward and to qualify the building blocks already before we create the composition. So in past, to be honest, we uh, we composed the system and uh, qualified that. So we had a lot of test cases on the final image. But uh, if you have many, many partners uh, in powerful systems and uh, uh, if this is the first, if you have the precondition to build the overall image before you can test it, then at a certain point in time, you land in a situation where you're no more able to create the system because you run from one issue to the other. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you do not come to that point where you really can do your quality assurance anymore. So you need to introduce an additional step to qualify your building blocks already, independent of the final composition. And then you go into the in the diversity of these different setups uh, and you test the resulting images again. And so the quality assurance from my perspective uh, is even more important in this diversity and system sizes and flexibility. So yeah, so we have two things, uh, I would say. First of all, it's not only about testing the image, it's also about testing the building blocks. And second is testing on real target hardware. Mm -hmm. So that all that is really tested in all variances and all target hardware. So uh, this is an important thing in an industrial uh, scenario. There are other scenarios out there as well where um, it's important to get that level of modularity and testing. And Linux is a common piece in a lot of them. And so like the enabling Linux and the safety critical um, is trying to start looking at trying to help make that part of it, the story to come together. But for the industrial space, pulling that full story together is, um, I'm not seeing anyone really taking a lead of pulling a community together yet. Mm -hmm. I think something like that would be potentially benefiting from if we if we were to you know stipulate some of the aspects that I think would be valuable be a, a really concrete set of reference hardware that you know academia and some of those use cases I mentioned earlier could just pick up and see working and something that has all these heads and interfaces that can be used you know complex GPIOs I square C whatever it is you're using so you have all these capabilities can for automotive and uh, over industrial aspects and so on, so that people know that they could just readily have it available because some projects try to do that, but then you can buy their reference system. So if you're in a university or if you're an industrial vendor and you don't have that, re that relationship with that SOC vendor, you, you can get the reference hardware. So it needs to be quite broadly available to have a broad appeal and, and really demonstrate these test results you can see in our CI infrastructure. You can achieve that for $200 mailed to your door by using this image. And, and that's something that I just haven't seen anybody achieving in industrial Linux uh, of late. So one aspect I mentioned in, in my talk was also uh, the support or the, the ease of use for, for the, the pieces, uh, the modules you want to add to your product. That means, for example, uh, supporting aspects like open source compliance and uh, uh, also then lifecycle management, vulnerability management and stuff like that. Could you give some insights on, 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 on that topic? Um, well, um, I'm going to jump in here because it's near and dear to my mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, You're doomed. It can't be done. It's impossible. No, <laughs> it can't be done. be done. There's actually a lot of focus now starting to happen about the software bill of materials. Yes. And um, because we need to know what is there, what are your dependencies, so that in addition to understanding what your licensing is, you can understand, hmm, is this, do I have the right version here? And is it potentially vulnerable to this exploit that's out there? And do I need to remediate or not? We need to be able to answer those questions quickly, especially as, as you know, was being said earlier, everything is connected these days and the attack surface is pretty wide in some cases. So being able to accurately identify, you know, I'm using this bootloader, is it potentially vulnerable to this? Oh, I'm using, you know, this piece, this hypervisor in this configuration component. Oh, I use this compiler to make my system. All of these are elements for attack vectors and having a much better grasp on the software transparency 
is something I think uh, we're going to be need to focus on and you know baking it in such that it's automatically generated right from the start um, you know is something that would probably do a big service to the industry if we had the clear transparency into the software components that make up an image. I know I've been talking with the Octo folk about um, they've got uh, SPDX metal layer going in to start generating out the material information, things like that. And so I'm, I'm sort of keeping my fingers crossed that you'll be having that showing up in the Octo and then the rest of the ecosystem will benefit from it. <laughs> Yeah, we've been doing that for our customers for a long time as well. We really embraced SPDX as a way to generate that side of it, more of the copyright and the code, and not being afraid of repeating us here. For industrial Linux, having that infrastructure that provides that for people will make a big impact. If you just tell people, here is a bunch of Git repositories and a bunch of recipes, and then do some tooling and go figure it out make something robust out of that um, it's a bit different like for real industrial solution you want to be able to say check 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 output verification report deliverable we're not afraid to share artifacts with you here is a build you can use um, i think that's very important and it's a different message industrial needs to be able to see that you can't sell to your manager something that doesn't have that literal pipeline of validation from the vulnerability aspect to the copyrights, to the license that are claimed versus the ones that are actually being used all the way down to an artifact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what is, uh, what I'd like to add is um, that we for sure need, an, an how to say, also in regard to the security topics and vulnerability handling, uh, yeah, really an overall solution because uh, it, uh, it, it's not sufficient if you have a start point and create your custom solution, you finally have to maintain it and you need to connect to some upstream. So you are not alone on the world. So uh, you have a starting point and you have downstreams and upstreams uh, and you need a way to be connected so that it's a seamless uh, approach. and. Um, this is very important from our point of view that the that's a process chain is not uh, interrupted and that you really have it in a, in a streamlined way. So with that, that you have a, an upstream where you can rely on, which has also well-defined security processes and uh, which you connect to. And uh, then we add our pieces for the industrial portion. So for sure, uh, uh, one thing is the really easy processing of uh, security patches, again, with the uh, quality assurance and so on, what we said, so and that you can uh, deploy it in a, in a way which uh, do not harm your system finally, yeah, so that it's in, in a controlled and mastered way. This is one thing. Um, the other aspect is uh, what you said, uh, the license. So, for sure, in the industrial scope, we also uh, need a license aware processing and to take care about GPL v3. Not every of our products uh, is allowed to deploy GPL v3 software. So, yeah, as you said already, with the safety things and so on, if everyone is able to change it, uh, it's maybe not a good idea for others. So there are there are some some conditions depending really on the product uh, type and uh, environment. So what we do is also having a good focus on that. And um, it's not the way that you cannot utilize in any product GPL v3, but uh, you have to process it according to your needs so that you do not get it in if you are not uh, able to deploy it. But uh, if you have a product uh, which uh, yeah, can deploy it, then you are able to use it so that it's in a, in a controlled way again. So on the other hand, uh, for the long run, if, uh, if you rely on a GPA v3 free uh, solution, then over time things may evolve and become GPA v3. And therefore we also then have uh, to cover this and to add countermeasures uh, to continuously uh, provide the GPA v3 free solution for these devices. So the license processing is one thing. Uh, the 
security processing and that it's all in an integrative approach with upstream and downstreams and the quality assurance and so on in the middle. Um, yeah, and what we have uh, furthermore in regard to this long life cycles, uh, in past, our approach was to extend the support time by somehow backporting important bugs to a former release. And uh, if the product needs a longer support time, we try uh, to address this with a longer, uh, with more money uh, doing the same approach. So backporting even uh, to even older revisions. So uh, what we see is we would like also to add uh, an additional life cycle into that so that we have a, a period of time, a phase where we can follow the mainstream by continuously rebasing to newer revisions. And this again influence uh, the way of the system design that you are eases this procedure of rebasing and you, you master the quality assurance and complexity in every rebase cycle. But that then the product team can decide, okay, for their life cycle, which phase it will utilize. So a certain phase uh, to mm -hmm. follow upstream and then later on uh, to follow the long-term support uh, period until end of maintenance. So this is uh, also one aspect to introduce this phase into the overall product life cycle. Yon, I have a question so for these you. these are because, a few aspects. Yon, I have a quick question for you because you, you we talked about the community outward facing, but something mm -hmm. that Audrey just stressed really well is the fact that you're serving downstream inside your organization as well. You have you have product teams that adopt what you do. And in the super ah, long-term yes. products that you have, <laughs> how much resistance do you face inside Siemens when you go and tell them you should really be updating this or we need to fix that? And sometimes they're just they're probably even more rigid than, than you'd like to see. So how do you cope with some of those challenges today? Or how would you like to see it improve? Yeah, well, this is a two-sided aspect. You have, of course, to provide a certain offer to them. <laughs> and on the other side, obviously, <laughs> as it's a large corporation, we also have the required processes uh, to remind people uh, at the product yeah. development uh, to do the updates. Uh, so by now, it's pretty well understood across um, all uh, products, product lines, uh, that updates have to be applied. Obviously, not all updates have to be applied to all products all the time. So this decision process is individual, um, but there is update processes happening and there is uh, enforcement uh, prior to the release uh, to establish those processes latest. <laughs> uh, not only after the thing is in the field and we got a notice that some device is vulnerable. Uh, that is a story from the past. Um, so obviously, yeah, the, the key point is actually that you have to provide an offer. And um, that was one of the stories basically where the CIP project evolved from um, is that we saw so many uh, product lines inside the companies, but also across the companies doing this ad hoc maintenance, which is per product maybe easy seen because it only affects a subset of the features, a subset of the uh, components. But if you sum that all up, it's highly inefficient and also not of the quality that you want to achieve. So um, if you have to go a long-term life cycle with the certain components, it would be definitely helpful to do this also in a collaborative manner, in a more collaborative manner than done so far. I mean, we know the activities around the kernel regarding LTS support, um, people, companies joining there on the LTS. Uh, we start to extend this with the SLTS activities and we are also trying to work together with Debian um, on enabling a certain, certain set of uh, packages uh, to take a longer life cycle possibly. Mm -hmm. um, so that will benefit um, all of us who want to use these kind of components in a longer fashion um, while uh, yeah, not solving the problems for all, obviously. Um, 10 years may sound a lot for some people in IT. Uh, um, for other people in industry, it may sound like, okay, that's the first quarter of my product life cycle. Um, so you have to always have to find a compromise. And uh, also what Andre was uh, addressing, um, ideal world would be, of course, continuous be able to rebase. 
So do your product maintenance by rebasing all your changes over the latest version, even the field. That involves testing again. So I think this is, uh, again, to stress the importance of testing. In the ideal world, we have the full yeah. control over our uh, assets and we can test continuously so we can rebase continuously and we don't need to support infinitely. That would be, of course, the ideal vision. This is also yeah. what we are working on. And this, if you if you go forward in this uh, in in this direction, um, it's a matter about uh, the maintenance effort and distributing these efforts across all organization and teams. So to to share this, and uh, there are, then you come to the question or to the uh, thinking about the overall approach. So you you have to create your system in a way that it's friendly for this rebasing. So to give you an example, uh, in past we had setups where we provided uh, to this uh, individual teams a tool and said to them, here's a tool, here's your starting set, uh, go forward to your uh, target specification and start working. And then they created software uh, on their way to their product and uh, another team again at a certain point in time forked from that. So said, okay, I need something similar. I will use this as a starting point and go then my way and another way team again and again. So you you end up in a huge set of branches and forks in something like that where each team is following their own mission and have installed locally in their Zillow, their tool, their software, their changes and they do it all according to their uh, target specifications. So they do not think much how to structure the code in a way that they can rebase it easily. They are more thinking about hitting the performance goals and so on, and the memory footprint and optimizing in that way and this way, so to meet their mission. And finally, you have a very, very optimized and fragmented way and multiple times uh, 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 copy it's the same setup more or less and if you then try to process a rebase due, through such a setup then all the teams has to rebase again they get a new version of the tool they get new revision of a kernel together with the new versions of the oss libraries they need to rebase all of their additions and each team again and again so if you sum up all the efforts uh, yeah, this is really expensive on the one hand. And the people, from their perspective, if you discuss this rebasing, um, they are all on their way to their next feature set and to their next, uh, um, how to say, uh, um, target specification. So this rebasing cycle uh, is utilizing or is disturbing their work. So. Um, they do not come forward in regard to the next features because they have to rebase their tools and uh, to, re to port or uh, um, yeah, to reapply all their changes. And on the, <clears throat> on the other hand, for sure, all that bring in a lot of risks and issues. So they need to do this qualification, what you said. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you have to think about at the beginning, what is the right setup uh, to make this so much more easier. Uh, and uh, yeah, this lead, for example, to the central setup that you have one uh, tool chain and infrastructure uh, provided to all so that not every team again and again needs to install a new revision of a new tool version and that you can maintain the common portion. Everyone has the same glibc in it maybe, but uh, you have it copied multiple times uh, in each and every team and everyone has applied different set of patches. So why doing this? So adding it to a central instance, maintaining the two all, only distributing uh, the pieces which are really changed uh, across uh, to the teams and so on. So you need a different setup. and and. Um, how to say the teams, uh, if you go the first time to such a team, they, they do only know what they have experienced. So um, a new way of working is uh, they need some level of confidence. So they need really uh, to see the change and uh, 
to experience uh, the advantage. So, yeah, I think this is actually a very important yeah, aspect of, to this of teams, the collaboration project. Yeah. So if you think about it, we are talking yeah. about technical aspects in many regards, but actually this is also our experience uh, internally, but also in collaboration with others. Um, it's very important that you also live the example that you envision mm -hmm. um, and you make sure that the people are following your example all the time. So even if you put the right tool there and they could use it in the perfect way, I'm pretty sure they will find a way to not use it perfectly. Uh, so you have to track them. Um, and you have to basically uh, fold again the structure you want to unfold uh, and you make a flat after a while again. So it's continuous architecture tracking, so to say. Um, that is simply important. And um, I think a collaboration project has a chance to live that by example. Um, I mean, no one is, is listening to me if I talk about something internally, but if I can point to an external reference doing the same thing that I was just preaching, um, that helps a lot. Um, so it's a cross-reference also for us in industry to show, look, that company, our direct competitor is doing it this way, we are doing it the other way. Don't you think we are doing it the wrong way? Um, and so you have a reference, a chance uh, to yeah, streamline your activities for the better. That's also, I think, an important vision for a collaboration project. Okay, so we're close to the end. Um, I would close the round with uh, one statement from everyone, uh, one priority you would say an industrial grade Linux should have under all circumstances. Who likes to start? <laughs> Ladies first. That is tricky to say. I mean, it has to have everything. Um, <laughs> one thing needs to have uh, dependability. It needs to be, be able to handle be security, modularity. It needs to be dependable. And all the components in it need to be dependable. They need to be trusted. Over to you, Jan. <laughs> I don't disagree. I don't disagree. So if I have to add something else, I would say uh, my personal uh, flavor would be to have it uh, in a very upstream friendly way. We might have lost Audrey, so I'll yeah. go next. I, I, I would say uh, something I've seen missing in a lot of the, the activities is the this notion of flavors, the fact that it needs to be available in the many different ways that potentially an industrial Linux needs to be able to be consumed. So uh, this awareness of the complexity of the various uh, systems that is going to be running and, and providing that as a sort of a stepping guide, providing something that's more than just the theoretical it's the Linux kernel and a bunch of middleware. You can do anything you want with that. So uh, that, that, for me, that would be important. Something that that can be morphed out of the box to to be shaped from the project, from the community to help people understand what they have to go through. Okay. Finally, Andre. Yeah. Just made it Don't in time. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was asked and Kate answered dependability, Jan answered uh, community friendly. I mentioned it needs to be multi-form and take into account all the factors that we need to be able to support. And what would be your, your number one request for an industrial Linux, Andre? Oh, my number one request. Um, Yeah, for me, it's really modularity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good then. Thank you very much. It was really a nice time uh, with all of you and an interesting discussion, hopefully also for the audience. Um, thanks again and yeah, see you later. <laughs> <laughs>